The most urgent need of your life is not another insight. It's to trust what you already believe. So why is it that no matter how many times I sing, oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, I still feel like God is disappointed or angry or rolling his eyes at me when I fall back into that same old sin pattern I can't seem to escape? And why is it that I can say all the things about grace and really mean them, but then I still live like performance or merit is at the end of the day where my worth lies? And why is it that I can be comforted in this room by the creator who knit me together in my mother's womb, but then I obsess over my calorie count and my body image every second I'm outside of this room? And why is it that I can resonate with the God who gives me a new name and then live like my boyfriend or my boss or my mother or my spouse holds the ultimate opinion over me and and authority in what my worth is? And why is it that no matter how many times I taste bread and wine around the communion table with my community, I never quite feel like I'm welcome at Jesus' table just as I am without cleaning myself up first? You see, the most urgent need of my life and your life is not another insight. It is to trust what you already believe. But how? How does that happen? How do I address that urgent need? Or how do I allow God to address it? How do I trust with my daily life what I already believe? And what is the pathway between knowledge in my head to spiritual knowledge that lives in my heart? Well, we have to move from belief to knowledge. You see, in English, we typically understand the word belief to be uh, deeper and more personal than knowledge, right? But knowledge is intellectual. It's information that we hold in our heads, but belief is this gut-level conviction. Knowledge is the language of the head, but belief is the language of the heart. That's the English understanding of the two, but it's not the ancient Hebrew understanding. The ancient Hebrew understanding of the word knowledge comes from the word yada, and it is a relational or an experiential knowledge. This is why again and again in the Old Testament, no is used as a euphemism for sex. Then Adam knew Eve. That's not talking about learning new information about Eve from a book. It is relational and experiential. It's the most intimate kind of knowledge. You see, in the Hebrew understanding, until you had personal, relational, experiential evidence, all you had was theory. And that's called belief. So most of us believe it's a bad idea to touch a hot stove, but some people know it's a bad idea to touch a hot stove. How? Because they've done it. They have relational, experiential knowledge with touching a hot stove, and that is yada. So we use this Hebrew understanding of knowledge occasionally in the English language when we speak of knowledge that lives in our five senses, not in our thinking. When we say things like, oh, she's just got a feel for the game. Or he has a touch for the saxophone. Or who designed this place? They've got great taste. Right? We're speaking about knowledge that is expressed through our body, through our five senses, not just held in our imagination. We're speaking of a kind of knowing that has to be acquired from experience and not by insight, a kind of knowledge that books can't help us with, but experience can, a kind of knowing that involves the intellect but demands the experience. So let me bring this a little bit closer. If you were to say to me, Tyler, how do you know your wife loves you? I would not recite our wedding vows to you. I would start telling you about all the ways that our relationship works and all the little ways that she chooses my company and all the times that she stuck with me and forgiven me when I was ridiculous or difficult or wrong or lost and all the occasions that she's been a rock of support to me and all the fun evenings together of laughter and the meals shared and the enjoyable moments of doing nothing together and the occasional evening of biblical knowing. That's how I know there's relational, experiential knowledge. That's how I know. You see, all the way back at the beginning of John's gospel, there's this cryptic reference Jesus makes to this distinction between belief and knowledge. This is John chapter 2. Many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. Now, the, the English believed here is the ancient Greek pistuo. Can you say that? But Jesus would not entrust himself to them. Now, the English entrust is the Greek pistuo. Can you say that? Less enthusiasm the second time. Understandable. (laughs) Because it's the same word. You see, a literal translation of this verse would read, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name, but Jesus would not believe himself to them. 
You see, he's saying there were many who believed in Jesus, but not in a way that allowed Jesus to entrust himself relationally to them. There's a way to believe in Jesus intellectually that stops short of entrusting yourself to him relationally. There's a way to believe that stops short of knowing. And it's telling that John places this cryptic reference of Jesus immediately before his midnight encounter with Nicodemus. Let me just read John's gospel to you. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. That's the very next verse. See, he's saying there's a way to believe in your head, but never in your heart. There's a way to recite the creeds, pray the prayers, and sing all the songs, but never experience the relational gift that rewires you from the inside out. Here's a picture of it. There was this guy named Nicodemus. You see, the Hebrew mind distinguishes belief and knowledge. Belief can be purely intellectual, but spiritual knowledge requires a link between belief and action. Until what is in your head has been experienced and embodied, it's just passive rumor that is powerless to shape you. It's powerless to heal your past, powerless to free your true self, powerless to give you forgiveness at the gut level, powerless to renew your mind in the language of Romans. At one end of John's gospel, we've got Nicodemus, a picture of believing doctrinally but not relationally. At the opposite end, though, we have a picture of Peter walking this inner journey from belief to knowledge. And nearly the whole of John's gospel is juxtaposed between these two bookends. That belief is buying into theory, but knowledge is to personally, vulnerably, experientially trust the theory that you already believe.